Thanks so much for, for having us here on the, the third day of the Greenwich Economic Forum. Angela, it's great to see you, as always. It's great to see you too, Daniel, and it's such a pleasure to be here. You know, I was to talk thinking about, about a lot of different things. <laughs> I'm even here next to my fire for our fireside chat, though I've been told uh, this fireplace hasn't been used in a couple hundred years, so I'm not allowed to to, to burn the house down. Um, but I, I was thinking about what a coincidence it is that we're talking during this election week, because it was four years ago at this time in November 2016 that we, we met in, of all places, Auckland, New Zealand at the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds. And it was such a different time. Um, I, I would say that, you know, that was before obviously COVID, before uh, so many of the, the geopolitical tensions that have marked the last few years. And that felt like an era of, of optimism and globalism, whereas those words today are, are kind of contrarian. So I feel, personally feel very lucky that we met then because uh, had we met today, I'm not sure that the partnership we built together would have been would have been possible. You know, and it's really interesting because four years ago I was in Auckland for the presidential election, um, which elected President Trump and the shock that worked through that country at that outcome and the surprise. And it was the start of this sort of populist wave. But you're absolutely right, Daniel, that the idea that we could build a partnership, it took some time um, to really figure out how this was going to work. But the idea that we could tap into the knowledge and resources of people located, investors located around the world and see the best and brightest of those ideas was really um, intriguing and interesting. And we made it. We crossed the finish line. And it's been a it's been an ongoing partnership and it's awesome. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was thinking about the fact also that that partnership constellation, which we'll get a chance to tell people more about today, um, wouldn't have happened but for the financial crisis in some ways, because it was after uh, 2008, 2009 that the term asset owner and the consciousness of being a sovereign or a pension on the global stage started to take shape. I think before then, um, sovereigns and pensions didn't come together to collaborate. And so, but after that, you had the birth of these institutions like the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds, the Institutional Investor Roundtable, uh, FERCAP, uh, so many other global organizations that brought what is a hundred trillion dollars of global institutional assets together. I don't, I don't know, uh, I, I forget exactly who was represented there in New Zealand, but it was probably, you know, in one room you had $20 trillion of AUM. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, and that yeah. made the foundation for the kind of collaboration that we put together. No, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. And, you know, people forget that coming out of 9-11, you know, 20, it'll be 20 years ago now, next year in 2021, um, that there was a lot of concern and speculation about where, where financial um, investments were being made, where foreign money was coming from, where investments being made for non-commercial reasons. And it's really out of all of that, um, that, you know, it started, people started talking and really doing the work about trying to find out and the value that could be created with the free flow of capital around the world and being able to invest in different countries and different asset classes. And what did that need to look like? And over that period of time, you know, between 2001 and 2008, uh, you know, the work that the U.S. Treasury did, the World Bank did, the international, you know, the um, uh, IMF uh, was really well received in terms of creating transparency into that, you know, that global movement of capital to the point now where we somewhat take for granted the idea that we can all invest 
uh, basically in any market, in any asset type, in any market that we want to, because it's become much more commonplace, uh, when in fact, for a very long time, that wasn't the case. You know, I guess I should say a word about what the partnership is that we actually built, because while we live and breathe it every day, probably many folks uh, at this forum don't know about it yet, but it's a it's an entity called Constellation. And it's a, a global consortium of asset owners from Juno to Stockholm, from London to Kuwait City, who pooled our resources and our talent together to try to reshape the dynamic between GPs and LPs. So we invest in the next generation of private alternatives managers, uh, acquiring stakes in growing alternatives firms across real estate, private equity, private credit, anything um, that is a crucial investable asset for our pensions and sovereigns. Primarily to date, it's been in the US and Europe um, but as we continue to expand globally through um, inclusion of asset owners from Asia and Australia in our network, we have global aspirations. And the idea was to improve on the model uh, of LP, GP, principal agency to create more alignment so that we could have better outcomes for our stakeholders who are pensioners and sovereigns globally. And, you know, it's worked. It's worked. I, I joke that I'm actually only 25 years old. I just aged a couple of decades <laughs> because it was hard to put it together across all of these jurisdictions, but, but it has worked. And um, so far we've, we've backed six really promising managers um, and, uh, and, and we're continuing to grow our, our partnership. Um, again, it, it couldn't have happened in this environment, but ironically, it's probably more important than it ever has been because having in place partnerships with each other and with experts at a time when none of us can get on planes. I know for us, it's helped enormously to be able to talk to your team in Juneau, to be able to ring up our friends in Scandinavia and get views on what's happening around the world at this, this crazy, crazy time. Yeah, I think, you know, in the private markets, especially we really rely on relationships and we rely on reputations and being able to talk and even when we want to invest in new funds there's a lot of due diligence that goes into you know who are they what is their track record what you know what what did they do well um that type of thing and when we're in this time that we've been in where we don't travel for work we don't have boots on the ground in the same way this idea that was started out of the premise that we're not always going to be able to have boots in the ground. We don't have here in Alaska the resources to have an office in Kuwait City. We don't have the resources to have an office in London. And so the idea that we can rely on our our partners at Railpen or on our partners at at Wafra for that matter, you know, is huge. And um and I think you can't underestimate those types of relationships and it's hard work and, and it's a competitive business. And so a lot of times in private equity, what we see is that if I make an investment and 20 other pe funds want to make that same investment, we're going to get cut back or some of us are not going to be allowed into that investment. And so the partnerships don't come easily as institutional investors, even though you may have an alignment of time horizon and outcomes. You know, one of the things that really struck me uh, in the COVID environment is six months ago, I think we could have said that at least in our lifetimes, this was the first time that everyone in the world, all, eight point whatever billion people were going through roughly the same thing at the same time, all figuring out how to deal with this pandemic. Um, what's changed since then is that COVID, some people call it a V-shaped recovery, some people call it a K-shaped recovery, but I'm not sure either one of those is accurate. It strikes me that it's been something much more complicated than a simple letter could capture. And I'm not even positive that it's it's a long-term recovery yet. We may have more um, challenges to go through 
uh, in especially in the US and, and Europe. And in that environment in which different industries have been impacted, you know, obviously hospitality and shipping and so many industries have been directly impacted. Others in technology may have benefited. Um, some geographies are more impacted than others. This is a time when, while we were initially going through a kind of shared global experience, it seems to me now uh, it's different on different shores in different industries and in different sectors and different geographies. And that's exactly the time when relying on experts and partners in those parts of the world is so helpful to the diligence that you described. Um, you know, with Constellation, we've tried to build this distributed brain, if you will, this kind of virtual company that brings together the CEOs, CIOs of groups like Alaska Permanent and AP3 and PIFIS in Kuwait, the Kuwait Investment Authority, um, uh, RPMI Railpen in London, as you mentioned, and just benefit from that collective knowledge and local expertise. And then as we partner with managers, Astra, Aura, Motive, groups that um, are roaring out of the gates with decades of experience in their specific industry, it helps us. I mean, I think the first step in partnership is the humility that you described of recognizing none of us can do it all ourselves. And then from there, thinking, well, who should I trust? Who can I partner with? And I think if we've done one thing well, it's find the right partners. Yeah, I would agree with that, Daniel. And I think what what really is important in all of this, too, is to recognize the alignment we have as as organizations. And the, the Permanent Fund was created 40 years ago. It invests for the benefit of the 700,000 residents of the state of Alaska within the U.S. Um, it is almost to $70 billion today. Uh, it has been a wonderful resource, especially in this time, to be able to help support the economy within Alaska. When I talk to our peers around the world, um, and for example, the partners in our in our investment in Constellation, it's that same sense of service and support, the idea that we have to help our economies, help our sovereigns, help our pensioners in some way, um, that really creates that alignment and in finding the right partners. And it is one of those things that I think we can sometimes take for granted. Uh, as, as institutional investors, you get caught in the day-to-day -day of the investment allocation. But that long-term time horizon and benefit to a broad group of people, I think, is, is so key and so important. So, Daniel, I'm curious. Um, so, what areas are you thinking about in terms of geographies or sectors that are looking really intriguing to you in light of all of this, um, everything that's happening. You know, I'm sure that one of the topics today that we'll hear about from our peers um, throughout the rest of these discussions and panels is what's going to happen at the impact of government you know, I wouldn't even call it a stimulus at this point. We've, we've gone from kind of Keynesianism to quantitative easing and, and aggressive monetary policy to now just sending people money at a scale that we've never seen before to, to keep consumers uh, in the market. Uh, there's, there's probably a limit to the government's ability to continue to, to prop up um, uh, industries and individual consumers. And as governments retrench, there will be opportunities to fill that capital vacuum. You know, institutional investors, as we talked about, have about 100 trillion of assets globally. They're the only other group besides governments that could potentially fill that void. Even within Constellation, which to us feels like a, a small and intimate partnership, we collectively have a, a trillion dollars of AUM between our partners. So that those opportunities that we're looking at, I think, are the ones that will witness distress as government uh, fiscal policy is forced to retrench because as we all know fiscal stimulus is just future taxes so at a certain point we have to uh, and, and there won't be a will amongst 
uh, Western democratic governments to continue to spend in that way, that will create opportunities for us to take care of our constituents in, in, in different markets. So that's what we will be looking for. You know, with that said, I don't want our kind of short term pessimism about some of these markets to indicate that we're not long term optimistic. You know, the permanent fund is a long term uh, a vehicle that's generational. Really, all of the partners in Constellation are taking a 20, 30, 40 year time horizon in terms of our views of markets. Uh, I, I, for one, am consoled by the fact that after the 1918 pandemic, we had the roaring 20s. Maybe we'll have the roaring 20s again um, uh, once we get our sea legs and, and we see economic recovery. And there may even be lessons that we've learned from this, um, lessons about how to continue to collaborate globally to, to build new models for, for corporate enterprise isolation that, that, um, that build kind of virtual networks. And it may help us tackle other problems that are like COVID, you know, invisible, global, and reflect, you know, shared need, whether that's climate change or, 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 or trade and find more equitable solutions for our constituents. So I'm, I'm kind of short personally. I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities in the next six to 12 months to be proactive investors, um, uh, which is the reflection of kind of short term bearishness in terms of some of the markets that we're in. We need expertise and partnership to, to activate those in and in, to access those in a, in a, in a professional way which we've built run though I'm, I, I remain, remain bullish. I don't know how you're feeling in terms of uh, the various markets that we play in together. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I guess I look at it a little bit differently than you because I look at the time horizon for um, a vaccine for COVID. I think there's a lot of optimism around when we'll see a vaccine, hopefully in the first quarter of 2021. And then I look at the timeline for additional fiscal stimulus in the United States anyways. Um, and I know that there's there's been an increase in cases and Europe is having to look at uh, shutting things down again. Uh, the United Kingdom has taken some actions in that front as well. And so when I look at the crossover, I'd like to think we're coming out of COVID while the fiscal stimulus is still in place. And so there's a tremendous boost over the next 12 to 18 months uh, to markets, which creates tremendous opportunity. Um, and we've also seen tremendous opportunity just in the innovation. COVID has required of us, uh, whether it's doing these virtual platforms like we are right now uh, and using them in the technology investment that has happened as a result, or it's in any of the logistics or supply chain management. I mean, there's a whole host of investment opportunities that probably weren't looked at or weren't as exciting uh, six to 12 months ago that all of a sudden seem really intriguing. So I tend to be, uh, really optimistic um, anyways. I lean optimistic. I, I, I'm, I'm not a bear. I'm not a bear investor, although there's definitely value in having bear investors in your investment committee and your investment group um, because they do provide that alternative viewpoint. Um, but we're, we're excited about where where the opportunity set lays, and not to mention what it means for the workforce and being able to tap in. You know, we talked about not having the ability to have resources like an office in Singapore, but the idea that maybe we can be much more actively engaged day to day in a way that we couldn't even consider before um, is hugely gratifying and exciting. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing where not just the permanent fund goes, but where we go as institutional investors. And we haven't even touched on what's on the geopolitical tensions that are going on around the world and the potential risks and, and vacuum, you know, risks and rewards that could create. So um, it's, it's a tremendous outlook for 2021. I, I I love your point about the optimism around vaccines, and we've we're witnessing a kind of Apollo mission here, a, a, a Manhattan Project, a huge effort across um, so many disciplines to to 
to improve things and, and to make an outcome that seemed impossible beforehand. And who knows what the benefits of that will be besides a vaccine, you know, the, the, the advances in science. Um, and in terms of our ability to work together, yeah, the irony is that as we've become sort of separate because of the restrictions on travel and whatnot, we've developed ways of increasing our connections, just like this conference is, is doing today. So uh, I, I agree with your long-term optimism. And in some ways, as institutions, we are the market, you know, collectively, um, uh, the, 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 the groups that have come together um, in constellation from different economies, different um, sovereign and pension institutions are so large that we need to be, rather than timing the market this quarter versus that quarter, looking for those kinds of long-term opportunities to benefit our, our stakeholders. So um, feel very lucky to be partnering with you all. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm also expecting great things in 2021. It's a great note to end on, Daniel. This has been a wonderful conversation. Terrific. Thanks, Angela. Great to see you as always.